All right, guys, it's hard to believe, but we are up to our final topic in our study of the Industrial Revolution. That's Unit 2. And the topic for our discussion today is urbanization and daily life. A reminder, urbanization simply refers to the growth of cities. So let's get into the topic and see how industrial cities were changing in the 1800s. We're going to begin by looking at urban settlement patterns and try to figure out kind of who was living where and what those living conditions were like. So we're going to make a prediction here. Which social class lived in the city center? Our second prediction, which social class lived on the outskirts of the city? So think that, think about that for a second. And the answer is that on the outskirts of the city, you'd see a lot more wealthy and middle class families because the outskirts of the city usually generally, generally a little further away from the factories and the noise and the pollution and the crime and everything else. They wanted to live in an area of town which is quieter, tree-lined, uh, and safer. So that's where you'll find your middle class, your upper class in these industrial cities. The working class families, however, tended to live near urban, uh, urban centers and also near factories, which often were in the city center or at least uh, somewhere near the city center. Um, these people lived in much smaller homes, often not a home at all, but an apartment. Um, you know, having an individual house for a family would have been very, very, very rare for working class. These people tended to, again, kind of cluster in around the factory because many of them are walking to work every day. They want to live uh, close by their uh, source of employment. Now, as we get into the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, you would see these things popping up in major uh, urban areas, um, say like New York City or Chicago. And what I'm referring to are tenements. So tenements tended to be these crowded apartment buildings uh, you would find in very much working class neighborhoods, poor neighborhoods. Uh, they tended to range in four, five, six, seven stories tall. Um, they were very tightly packed, very tightly crowded. Um, but this is a place the working class could afford to live. So here's your, kind of a layout of your typical, uh, what's known as a dumb dumbbell tenement. Dumbbell because of the shape of the apartment building itself. Kind of looks like a dumbbell, skinny in the middle, fat on the edges. Um, and so here's the layout for a particular floor. Uh, so here's one family's living space, basically right here. There would be the stairs to get up and down the building. Uh, there would be a restroom here and a restroom here. Uh, and so you have four families here on this floor, and they're all sharing uh, two restrooms, basically. A couple images from the tenements. Um, you can see, again, just things tend to be very crowded, small space, uh, not a lot of privacy or anything like that. Uh, these kids out here playing on the, what's known as a fire escape. Fire, of course, was always the great dread of living in one of these uh, buildings. Notice, though, the American flag prominent there. Uh, these people, um, you know, pretty patriotic despite their tough circumstances. All right, now let's go into main idea number two and look at some improvements in city infrastructure. And uh, let's begin by talking about street lights. So, of course, street lights we have today, uh, they're powered by electricity. But before electricity, what powered street lights? What gave them light? And in the earliest days, uh, it was um, natural gas. So you would have someone come by and they would light the gas lamps. And um, this is, wouldn't give you a lot of light, but it certainly would give you some. And any light at all in the street is very uh, nice. Very, uh, it makes the city um, safer um, and people are a little more confident to go outside when it's not pitch black. Uh, sewers, another major development in cities. Sewers, of course are going to carry away all that waste to be treated somewhere else rather than having it pile up or uh, contaminating the water uh, for the city. So it's going to make cities safer, livable, um, and much more enjoyable living in cities because of that. All right, speaking of um, cities growing and getting more densely crowded, um, I'm thinking about an invention, a transportation invention that both sped up the movement of people and helped reduce overcrowding in the streets. So it's speeding up movement and helping reduce overcrowding in the streets. And the answer, of course, is the subway. 
and London, England was the first open subway in 1863. Uh, for some historical context, that is right in the middle of the American Civil War. And subways, of course, uh, allow people to speed back and forth across town without having to be in the streets, so it's going to reduce some of the traffic and crowding in the streets. Subways will pop up all across the world. Um, New York has a very famous subway today. All right, so now we have the issue of very expensive land in the city center. So you want to build a building, but you can't afford to own a lot of land in the city center because it tends to be very expensive. So this is going to change how people built buildings. Instead of building out, they're going to build up. And to build these new skyscrapers, you need more steel, which was a product of the Bessemer process we talked about in our last video. So <clears throat> skyscrapers, these don't look um, incredibly tall compared to modern day scra skyscrapers, um, but they really point to uh, a modern city that, again, instead of building out, you're going to build up because uh, you don't want to uh, buy all of this land. You only buy this little footprint here and then you simply build up. It's a much more efficient use of space. Uh, this is the famous flat iron building being constructed in New York City. And um, the very first skyscraper was this building here in Chicago, built in 1885. It was originally 10 stories. They later added two more on top. Uh, the building no longer stands. It was replaced by a much taller building back in the 1930s. And again, we from 2020 look at this and think, that, well, that's not a skyscraper. Uh, but it was. Uh, for the time, the, you know, building a, a 10 to 12 story building was was exceptional. And of course, what makes a skyscraper function is not just the steel skeleton, but to make it really function, you have to have elevators. Because if you don't have elevators, no one is going to want to climb 10, 12, 14, 20 stories up. That's just not going to work. So the elevator really unlocks the ability to build tall, tall buildings. All right, now let's look at a little bit of entertainment in the 1800s in the cities. And, uh, well, let's try to figure out what people were doing in their free time. And one of the things they may have been doing in their free time would be going to the local music hall. And the music hall was basically just kind of like a big auditorium. Uh, it might very well be music being played. Uh, someone might also use the space to put on a play. Maybe a magician uh, comes through town. Um, there's all kinds of acts, comedy acts and so forth that would come. So it's just a place to go. Um, and just, you know, watch these performances. If you weren't going to the music hall, you might also want to check out the movies. And remember, we talked about how Thomas Edison's team comes up with the motion picture camera in the late 1800s. By the early 1900s, we have uh, full-fledged films. Now, these were silent films, of course, but they were films nonetheless. Um, originally, they only lasted, you know, maybe a minute or two. But eventually, we have uh, films that last dozens of minutes, and then, of course, longer, with actual plots and special effects and all kinds of stuff. And this is something uh, people really enjoyed doing, because it was cheap entertainment. Now, speaking of entertainment, just like today, sports were really important back in the 1900s, early uh, 1900s, late 1800s. And one sport in particular here in America was by far the most important, and that was baseball. Americans were absolutely baseball crazy in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Every town had at least a team. Even small towns fielded a team. Um, even factories and other businesses would, would create a team and they'd have like a little league where they'd play on Sundays against uh, other factories. It was just the thing to do. Football was also kind of coming of age uh, and increasing in popularity. And over in Europe, you would have seen another version of football, what we call soccer here in America, also picking up steam. So as we, again, as we get to the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, things are looking so much more familiar to us, so much more modern. You've got sports, you've got movies, electricity, uh, telephones, cars, airplanes. I mean, the world really is becoming modern at the turn of the century. Uh, really quickly, guys, I thought I would share this with you. Uh, we've already seen this card before, Honus Wagner. We talked about this baseball card in the context of supply and demand a couple of videos ago. Uh, this baseball card, extremely valuable, not because Honus Wagner was the best baseball player of all time or anything, but because the baseball card itself is extremely rare. 
Uh, these usually when they go on auction, rarely when they go on auction, uh, they sell for, uh, you know, well over a million dollars, which is a lot of money for a little piece of cardboard. All right, guys, that is it for urbanization and daily life. It is also it for Unit 2, the Industrial Revolution. So we've covered a lot of ground in this unit. We looked at the beginning of this unit as to how the Industrial Revolution began in Britain for all those factors, things like um, natural resources, rivers, stable government, and so forth. We talked about the spread of the Industrial Revolution. We looked at how it created a new middle class. We looked at uh, some of the urban challenges like pollution. Um, that sprang about because of the rapid movement to the cities during the Industrial Revolution. We looked at new ideas like capitalism, communism, socialism. We also looked at some new technologies, things like airplanes, telegraph, telephone, stock ticker, you name it. New technologies were coming online. We also looked how science was changing and how that science affected society. A good example of this would be uh, Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. And we also look today at things simple as people's free time activities. What did they do for entertainment? So to, to sum all this up, the time period we're looking at right here, 1750 to 1914, really is the birth of the modern world. Um, if you had lived in 1700 versus 2020, the difference would be uh, vast. I mean, incredible difference. But if you had lived in 1914 as opposed to 2020, while well, certainly there will be lots of differences, it would seem a lot more familiar to you than someone living in the early 1700s. All right, guys, that's it for Unit 2, the Industrial Revolution.